Kanye found you first. That's right. And then Pharrell found you. That's right. So Pharrell stole you from Kanye. <laughs> Damn it. Sarah, hey Jay. How are you? Welcome to LA. Thank you. Come on in. This is awesome. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. This is the living room <laughs> and also the music room. Um, as you can see, I've got a whole variety of instruments here so we can do whatever we want when we have cool oh. ideas. Know how, where to figure out how to start learning. Well, oh, you do this, and yeah. you want to kind of slap it, like you're punishing it, like okay, like, it, like it's my boyfriend, like it's your boyfriend. Just like okay. your boyfriend. Boom, <laughs> bad boyfriend. Exactly, <laughs> just like that. This feels almost Art Deco. Is this, well, this is Art Deco? I'm a, I'm a big fan of 1970s Italian furniture and industrial design. Yes, and it so feels like it. People kind of have forgotten about this stuff. I this was all designed by a guy named Vico Magistretti, who was a genius. So all of these convert up and down, and these two open up. Um, wow. Leg rests that come out. I think they're just genius. Oh, I see the leg yeah. rests. How can, can we do like pull leg oh, rest out? We can try. Look at that. Oh. And they recline, so they're like a transformer of a chair. Yeah. So I just thought they were so cool. So we, these are all oh. old pieces of furniture that I bought on the internet. Do you or your wife design this mostly? Well, we collaborate, but I love interior design and I love architecture. And a lot of the books here, this is my library, a lot of the books are architecture books. So Wait, I've Lauren, had to learn a lot. Lauren Greenfield. Yeah, I, I think I know this her. is, um, you were, well, the documentary you were in, this is the book for it. Six. Yeah, because Lauren Greenfield came and shot me. Really? At the in, school? In Beijing, yeah, right. at, at my school. And um, that's me. Oh, wow. Those are my students. Oh, my God. You're teaching people here the names of luxury brands. It's called uh, Pim Pai Duyin. It's the correct pronunciation of foreign okay. luxury brands. This is the center of the house. Yeah, so this is our kitchen, and we wanted it to be purple and make us happy because we spend a lot of time in here. Um, wow! This is our dining room. Um, we've got a great view of the mountains. What is that over there? Is that? Uh, I believe these are the San Gabriel Mountains, and uh, on a clear day here, you can see them across the panorama. So we really love being sort of in nature. That's the other thing about LA. Is it's a huge city, but it's surrounded by nature, and it's got nature throughout it. So we like to keep the doors open and just enjoy the fresh air. And it's um, so minimal. It feels so shulful. We don't like, like too much stuff, you know. It's yeah. I think uh, real luxury is having a light life. So. Marie Kondo, we agree with exactly, you. Exactly. Yeah. We just got a tour of the house. It looks beautiful. Thank I think you. it's my first time in the valley. Yeah, okay. And <laughs> well, the valley is a bad name in LA, but Why? we're trying to reclaim it. Oh, really? So the valley is where all of the people who do real work in LA live. <laughs> so, you know, maybe not the movie stars, but the people who are editing the movies, the people who are writing the music for the movies, the people who are recording albums. It's all in the valley, all the great old recording studios, the film studios. Um, the best sushi in the United States. Stones throw from here on Ventura Boulevard. I heard that Kanye West discovered you. He played a very important role in my life. I was just a college student and we were making music and um, sent our recording to a guy who worked for him. And Kanye is a very authentic, sort of um, self-directed person. He heard our music and literally called me on my cell phone in my dorm room. And that was my big break. And how old were you? I was 21. And when you got the phone call, what's his number? <laughs> I think it was I think it was private and I almost didn't answer it. And when I did, he said, hey, this is Kanye calling. I thought, and you said, there's no way. Are you sure? Can you prove it? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I got your album from, from my manager, uh, Don, who was the guy who had given it to him. And, um, and then he, he invited us to come out to Los Angeles, and that was my first time on the ground here. 
But how did you feel? Were you nervous about meeting him for the first time? He's obviously, even 10 years ago, he was a huge deal. He's been a huge deal for a very long time. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, he was a musical hero of ours. We loved the music he was making. So for us as two young musicians, it was just insanely exciting. And um, we went and met him at the recording studio in West Hollywood where he was working. And um, it was incredible just to see him making music up close, the way he did it, the energy he brought to it, um, and the whole scene around it. What do you think he liked about your music? Well, I think the, the, the music that we always tried to make and that I've always tried to make is sort of music for music connoisseurs. So, so it's, it's not mass. Well, you know, I always wanted it to be mass, but it tended to be the case that people who liked it a lot were people who were really musical. So other musicians or people who were serious music fans. I think it's sort of like wine or something. You know, the, the more you understand about wine, the more you perceive in it. And so I've always sort of aspired to make music for people who are really into music, um, like myself. And then I read that Kanye and Pharrell discovered you together. Is that right? The two of them learned about our music um, within two weeks of each other. And then actually ended up competing with each other to sign us to a record deal, which was a little bit awkward because we were big fans of both of theirs. Um, and, you know, we ultimately ended up working with Pharrell, but we've remained friends with both of them. So was Kanye pissed? I don't think he was super happy. <laughs> I don't think he's used to losing. <laughs> but, um, you know, in our minds, uh, it was a complicated decision to make because they were working with different record companies. And, um, and as I said, we were just huge fans of both of them. And so Kanye found you first. That's right. And then Pharrell found you. That's right. So Pharrell stole you from Kanye. Kanye may have felt that way at the time. I don't think that's really what happened. When you got Pharrell's phone call, yeah. tell us about that. I, I mean, that was equally incredible. Between, I think, 1999 and 2003, the Neptunes, which was Pharrell's sort of production team, it was him and a guy named Chad Hugo, and they're both geniuses, they had, I believe, at one point produced and written something like half of all the songs that were on the radio. So, the sort of soundtrack of high school for me was their music. It was Pharrell. And yeah, and when we got a chance to meet him and work with them, it was like unbelievable. So at that time, Pharrell was a bigger deal than Kanye. They were both a big deal. I mean, Kanye was at the beginning of becoming enormous. He had, I think at the time, put out only one album, which is called College Dropout, and it was an awesome debut album. And he was working on his second album, which I think is called Late Registration. When we got together with him, I, I remember very vividly, and I even have videos of it, him driving us around LA and playing us in his car. Hustling. The new songs from this new album that had not yet come out. And um, I had a little video of him on my phone because I was trying to capture all the memories from this experience. And you know, from that time until the album came out, might've been eight or nine months. And I loved the songs so much that I was listening to them on, on my phone, just these little bad recordings um, because they were so catchy. And, um, and when it came out, it sort of felt like, wow, we were, we were there as he was making history. So that was, that was Kanye before he married Kim? That was, year, years before. What was it like for you? What were some of the your expectations and what were some of the surprising things about working with Kanye or being with Kanye? I mean, because he's so eccentric, right? We hear about him, like you said, I mean, he just will do and say anything that he feels like doing, even, you know, if it means he's pissing off Taylor Swift. Um, but was he, what was he like, like really in person? One of the things I really admired then about Kanye and continue to admire is that he's incredibly true to himself. And he says whatever he's really feeling. There's no BS. That's often how great artists are. They say what's on their minds. In, in some ways, that's the luxury of being an artist, that you have the freedom to be Express honest yourself. as you see it. Mm. Now, sometimes he gets into areas that are not his specialty, and that's, you know, can, can be a problem. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, he's an incredible musician, a great artist, and uh, his personality is consistent with that. And how is, work, how is Pharrell different from, from Kanye? Well, Pharrell's a master, and he's a master producer, and one of his great talents is that he can do so many different kinds of music, 
but always puts the same sort of love and energy into all of it. So whether he's doing funk records or rock records or R&B records, all of which he's done wonderful music in, um, it always has this Pharrell element to it. Um, and it's a magic trick. I don't know how he does it, but it's always blown me away. It seems like Pharrell's a lot more low key than Kanye. He's really made his career producing for other artists. And so that's inherently a more sort of behind the scenes role. And I think it kind of suits his personality. I have to admit something to you. I was a little nervous about meeting you today because I saw you in the movies about a year ago. No. Um, this movie, Generation Wealth, oh God. as you know, featured you. <laughs> and um, I'm sure you remember that in the movie, one of the things you were doing in your etiquette school was teaching women how to eat a banana properly. And so I, I don't want to put you on, but we have some bananas here. And I was wondering if you could teach me how to do this because how to I'm, be a I'm, lady. I'm a savage. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a proper lady and I, no, I want to be you one. You want to be a real lady. I want to be a real lady. I want to be so a this real is Chinese a setup. lady. Yeah. This is how I eat fruit normally. Okay. With a knife and fork. With a knife and fork. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we eat fruit here like monkeys. Just hands, there's the peels everywhere, fruit juice everywhere. All right, so let me show you how Lady Diana learned how to cut. So sort of this? Is this? <laughs> Depends if you're right-handed or left-handed. Oh, okay. Fork, left hand, okay. knife, right hand, okay. and the way you hold the knife and fork, the ends should be in your palms, in your palm. like it's this. Like a, like a drumstick. Like, oh, like, yeah, a, drumstick, like a drumstick, which okay. you'll need to show me how to do later on. Okay. Two index fingers over the back. Okay. Because this gives you, you know, leverage. leverage. Okay. Very good. Um, half moon shape facing you. So, okay. so the banana facing you, which so is exactly how it is. Happy. It's it's an unhappy face okay. that knows it's about to be devoured. Uh oh. So what at first I do is I cut off this head, okay. and then I cut off this tail. Okay. Put the fork just so it's just skin deep okay to kind of hold this hold is very place. graphic okay. <laughs> okay yeah and then and then yeah. i twist the knife 90 degrees okay. okay and i cut the underbelly of the banana jeez also only skin deep you're like a serial killer of bananas <laughs> okay and then now at the same time you have to keep your elbows close to your chest like okay. go close to your sides okay. Okay. You great. don't want, you don't want no, rings. No, none of okay. this. At our finishing school, what we do is we, we put two sheets of paper under our ladies' armpits. Uh -oh. So they have to hold. Oh, know. wow. And then what I do is I do the same mm -hmm. over here, 45 degrees. Oh, wow. And I slice. Ooh. There wow. we go. Get it right there. And then what happens is this. So cool, right? It's like surgery. Wow. And then you cover it like that, and then you eat it from the left side to the right side. Wow. I'm gonna try and emulate what you just masterfully taught me to do, okay? And you know we have penalties. Um, well, I'm gonna give it my best shot. <laughs> We're okay, gonna put so, so, a banana under your arm for each mistake that's done. All right, well, there are only five bananas <laughs> here, so. Awesome, you need to do it in 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. So we start- Oh wait, stop. Don't move. Oh, oh <laughs> gotta keep the arms tight. That was quick. <laughs> okay. Okay, here All we go. All right. Okay. Cut off the the tail. <laughs> the, the head. The head. Stop. Oh no, oh no. I miss I misidentified it. Okay. Uh -oh. All right. Okay, and now cut off the tail. Yes, very good. Uh stop. No moving not, the no plate. Touching the plate. Oh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Your wife's not going to be happy that all these bananas, bananas have okay, been... Okay, okay. Um, and now you take the, the nanner and... Uh, no, no, no! <laughs> Sarah, I don't think I can make it in China. <laughs> I don't think you're going to be a lady. Okay, well, anyways, make the most of it. H have a would taste. You, would, you like some, <laughs> would you like some of my, my beautifully prepared <laughs> banana? Well, you're also on La La Land. 
How I did was. That happen? I mean, my, my life is like a series of weird accidents. And one of the weirdest was that when I started my band Chester French uh, with some friends in college, two of our members, our drummer and our keyboard player, went on ultimately to have these incredible careers in the film business. And so they're Harvard. They were. We met freshman year right? in our dining hall. And Damien Chazelle was our drummer. And Damien had a huge breakout success with his film uh, Whiplash, uh, which was a big hit about drumming. And then La La Land was the next film that he wrote and directed. And so our keyboard player, Justin, um, has been Damien's partner in all these movies and is a, a wonderful film composer. So Justin actually had the idea when they were working on La La Land that I might be a good fit for this sort of comedic cameo character, which was the lead singer of an 80s cover band in a particular scene at the beginning of the movie. And they called me and said, you know, would you want to do this? And I said, well, I'm not an actor. I don't know what I'm doing. They said, trust us, you'll do just fine. Um, and so I said, sure, having no idea that this movie was going to be the incredible success that it was. What was it like to, to work with Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone? Is, is he as good looking as he is on camera? So good looking. Oh. It, was, it was, I was, I had butterflies the whole time. Um, Wait, because of Ryan Gosling because of Emma Stone? Well, I, I'll leave that up to the viewers. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it was, it was fascinating for me as a musician who doesn't know anything about acting to see really good actors like that up close and, and in their element. Sometimes, I think if you're just a random person, you can think, oh, being a movie star must be easy. You just sort of show up and you pretend and then you go home and you win an Oscar. But watching them, it was so clear that they were incredibly precise technicians. And, you know, um, with, with Ryan Gosling, who I'm in the scene with, I mean, every time we did a take of it, he would go and watch the replay and fine tune his facial expressions to make sure that the subtlety of the emotion was there. And I watched it and I thought, wow, I could never do that. I mean, it was like watching, you know, Michael Jordan play basketball or something. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I got you something from China. Yeah? Something is musical. Oh, wow. And something is edible. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to show you first okay. the musical thing. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Have you heard of Chris Wu? Wee Fan? Uh-uh. No? Uh-uh. But he made it to number one in the Apple iTunes last year. Are you serious? Year. In the U.S.? In the U.S. He wow. kicked off Ariana Grande. Okay. Wow. Well, that's a big deal. Okay. And so I'm going to show you his most popular Oh, wow. Song. This guy's cool. Okay. Look at that chain. <laughs> What do you think of this? Wow. Song? I mean, it's great. It's, you, you, you can't even really? tell where it's from. It's a global sound, you know? Really? That's the thing I love about music right now is, is because of the internet, everyone is on the same page. And you can tell that this is very influenced by T-Pain, by artists over here. I mean, it's got, it's got 10 years of musical history baked into it. And his chain is off the hook. I'm not sure if we in China really truly understand the spirit of hip-hop. Oh, my god! What is the spirit of hip-hop? The spirit of hip-hop... Well, I don't know that I'm an authority on this, but it, it is an American art form. It's about fierce competition. It's about skills. So historically in America, rappers compete with each other. Um, originally in rap battles, which was sort of the live format for people to, to um, improvise raps on the fly. And then in recordings where artists would go at each other and try to outcompete the other, both on skills and in the sort of um, venom of their disses of each other is there a reason why the best hip hoppers seem to be black you know i think hip-hop in america comes out of a long tradition of african-american music mm -hmm. um if you if you look back in american history it's not that old of a country uh, it doesn't have china's kind of incredibly deep history but we have invented a lot of cool stuff in a short period of time and um, the distinctly black traditions in american music are some of our greatest contributions to world culture so there's a sort of straight line through jazz mm -hmm. and rock and roll and then hip hop yeah. where the innovators tended to be marginalized artists from uh, black communities, um, usually in the eastern part of the United States. But then in the 90s, you had West Coast rap music um, that really came out of L.A. And that's yeah. a major contribution this city made to the world. And it still is making it with artists like Kendrick Lamar, who are from here. La 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 
la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la Beautiful. You've got it. You're ready to go. One and a two and a one, two, three, four. Nobody makes me feel Nobody makes me feel Nobody makes me feel the way you do. Nailed it. 太难了。咔咔咔。好。Okay. <laughs> Dear, I think we need to do a Chinese version Ooh, of the song. Okay, I would love that. So it's going to be... May or in wrong or gan jue. May or in wang or wrong or gan jue. Wrong or gan jue. And then the second line is... Xiang ni yi yang. Xiang, xiang ni yi yang. Yes, xiang ni yi yang. Xiang ni yi yang. Yeah. Xiang ni yi yang. Yes. Xiang yang ni yang. Is that going to be right? Okay, you ready? <laughs> okay. One and a two and a one, two, three, four. May or a wrong one can choose. In the mainland. Awesome. <laughs> Eating out jar and like by Jigger in your walk. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll be posting a new video each week with tips and tricks that I think will help all of us lead a better life.